Um, so one of the things which obviously EPSRC put quite a lot of money into into this, and I thought that actually one way that we can you know really help our communities is actually help our researchers navigate some of the resources that are just out there. Um, and sort of so this is a kind of whistle stop tour which I give to. Uh, I think it's well Sarah invites me every year who was here who is somewhere waving probably um, to give a kind of a talk to a sort of set of master students um, around what the UK's supercomputing landscape looks like um, and um, so you're kind of getting that and obviously there's there's bits that are totally missing around um, you know some of the you know secure data storage sort of side of things and some of the networking aspects and that, that and there's probably other experts in the room that I'd probably defer to but this is a kind of start of a 10 overview of what the UK's DRI kind of looks like and then Marion will um, go and talk about some of the more software aspects of um, so I'll be kind of hardware and Marion will be kind of more software investments okay so um, this is the sort of 101 slide around what do we actually mean by it's sort of so what we're going to cover is what do we mean by supercomputing we've kind of talked about HPC quite a bit um, but do we all know what it actually is um, let's let's get that kind of bottomed out I'll talk a little bit about funding councils and supercomputing who funds what who doesn't fund anything what what is it these things called different supercomputing tiers and then uh, things about specific facilities, these have been touched on a little bit, what exists within most institutions, what is this national tier two stuff, and what is our kind of national capability, what are the uh, access mechanisms, what's next, and then the, the software development stuff that Marion will, will, will come in with. Um, so year, so sort of midway through my, my career to date, I remember this whole kind of thing around computational science being regarded as the third leg of modern scientific inquiry alongside experiment and theory. Um, and often this is the only way to do various bits of um, insight because sometimes you get experiments that could be just too controversial to do, sometimes experiments can be too expensive uh, to do, um, often sometimes they're quite dangerous. Um, if you think about if you think about the example which is there uh, maybe they're actually illegal to do um, and you want to have a kind of idea about what might happen but I'm not allowed to do that experiment um, and then some are just impossible like you know climate change stuff is just impossible to do um, in terms of um, experimentation wise um, and then there's obviously this big data kind of um, explosion where and particularly with regard to large-scale experiments such as CERN or the SKA, where in order to actually digest the amount of data which you've got, you actually have to do a computational experiment or use um, some sort of um, high-performance computing to actually get intelligence on that data. And I think some of the, what, we've, what we've seen in recent years is some of those things that you only see in the kind of... Um, in the kind of national capability, the kind of CERN type data infrastructures, certainly um, if we're sort of about something like the, the Crick Institute or something like that, you actually start seeing these data challenges sort of being arising on the campuses, um, which is an interesting challenge. So um, I once put this into a, a paper at Leeds, which actually got a building built eventually, but this is myself and Sarah's picture about how these various things all interoperate together around kind of a kind of super lab kind of um, uh, uh, capability where really you know you have these three um, sorts of pillars of computation uh, of, of, um, of, of inquiry and how they all interoperate together in order that you kind of you observe things but then you can start to understand those things and then you start to be able to from those things be able to predict those things and we've seen in recent years the whole data analytics side of things really knitting all these things together. Um, so what do we really mean by supercomputing? Okay, so this is just really enabling a scale of calculation that can't be performed just on the desktop. Uh, but our desktops are really powerful nowadays, um, particularly if they've got graphics processing units in them. Um, and we often think about this whole we've got a whole session on cloud technologies and you know these you know often cloud technologies allow kind of 
an ensemble of these calculations by often kind of oversubscribing, putting a lot more load on than you've actually got physical machines. Whereas supercomputing, you tend to drive things in totally the opposite direction, where you're actually trying to um, couple a, a, a single program across multiple machines to enable kind of something that you couldn't do on a, on a, on a single machine. Does that go or not? Okay, so this is just a thing that I give the master students that have never come across something like parallel processing before. Um, basically, you could think about doing a piece of work A, B, and C, and D, and all those following each other. But the real key is to tease out bits of the calculation that can actually be run concurrently at the same time. So um, if you're able to do elements of that work at the same time, um, then you can cut the actual time to science down. The thing that kills you always is to what extent do all of these little these these sub packages need to communicate with each other so they all have the right version of the truth? Um, cause so communication kills. Okay, so now once we had a, we know kind of what supercomputing is and we know um, uh, what, what it's capable of doing. So how do the funding councils? approach supercomputing. So um, we've now got this thing called UKRI, a sort of umbrella organization over the research councils. But actually, if you kind of look within that, um, officially, only the engineering physical sciences, EPSRC, who funded this workshop, and the um, and NERC for the natural environment, and the STFC actually fund supercomputing in, in a kind of official kind of funding stream kind of way. Um, but having said that, any grant can actually, irrespective of funding, can uh, funder can actually ask for resources, supercomputing resources, uh, and it's all part of a of a national infra infrastructure roadmap, um, you know. But actually, you know, and you will probably see that things like the MRC will actually concentrate a little bit more on things that are more suitable for uh, personal kind of. Um, you know, sort of personal identifiable data and, and that kind of thing, and the data security aspects are kind of good. So th there's different elements of uh, specialty that each of the research councils really kind of uh, conforms with. But officially, supercomputing-wise, really only those three um, formally invest in um, uh, in it with a with a particular capability. So this is like a bit of what's out there. Um, so. Uh, we, we sometimes see in the news things like the Met Office, who've got a, a large focus on weather forecasting. They've got a large um, computing facility down in Exeter. Uh, a similar sort of machine is our national capability Archer, uh, which is based up in Edinburgh. Um, there's also a for particle physics, astronomy, nuclear theory program within STFC. There is a national facility split over four sites uh, called Dirac, and each one of those uh, machines has got a specific purpose. Um, the Hartree Centre, which is just over in Warrington, um, that has a kind of HPC orientated uh, focus around um, engaging with industry and commerce. Um, and then we have this multitude of things in th that we kind of had got, got this thing funded on, on the back of, which was the EPSRC tier two services, um, which we will come into in, in, in um, a bit later on. There's attached to the, the National Capability at Archer, there's a research data facility based at uh, Edinburgh Power Co Computing Centre. One thing that I won't come to is um, this sort of uh, data analysis cloud, which is Jasmine, which is based out for the for the National Environment Research Council, um, and then there's uh, oh I put the Earlham down here, <laughs> we've got Steve from who's just started at the Earlham who have um, so the BBSRC basically put all their money in to sort of create a kind of sort of load of labs down in Norwich, and there is a large scale kind of computing provision that spans across those research institutes that Steve now runs. <laughs> So here, here are the, the sort of supercomputing tiers, and at the bottom I put this kind of, um, most people show this the other way up, where you have these at the pinnacle, but actually, um, in terms of numbers of users that they can actually leverage these things, um, actually it's relatively few applications that can actually use these things. So I put them at the bottom, okay, that they have these sort of T0, 
you know, you can use these things if you can prove that you're able to actually use them insight and the kind of price kind of um, facilities. Although I'm not sure quite where we are with price nowadays after the whole Brexit thing. Our national capability, uh, we have the Dirac and Archer platforms. And then there's this multitude of things within the uh, tier two uh, space, which, so these were the original tier two sites, which I'll go and explain. Uh, and then added into that, there is also a, a Northern Ireland HP, HPC and uh, the NHCIR, which is what we are, um, which, uh, which is sort of the organization that I, I kind of belong to running the, the bead system. Have I missed everyone out there? We've got the, so HPC Midlands Plus also includes that, that latest thing that's in Warwick, which I'll come to. So for completeness, um, there's actually a, a hpc.ac.uk site that has a lot of these uh, items on it, which I hope someone sticks in the chat. Um, but, um, but yeah, so, but some of the links are here in terms of, that's where you go to find out about Dirac. And we've got plenty of people coming later in the week from Dirac to tell us um, about, about the um, these sort of approaches that they take um, within, within their communities to some of the uh, DRI kind of aspects of their roles. Um, there's some, that's where you find out information about price and also the, if you have somebody that can do this, these hero calculations, then that's where you find the, um, the, the insight program. Okay, so the one that's really close to home is actually most research intensive universities um, have some sort of HPC provision. A little show of hands. How many, are, how many people in there are not aware of their institutional HPC provision within their organization and not aware. Brilliant. Everyone is aware that they have an institute. Everyone, so everyone has a HPC within their organization. That's brilliant. Brilliant. Um, so the things we, and I think that the, the, the academic panel alluded to a lot of this, okay, this whole idea that a lot of these have been built with a kind of very low barrier of entry. Um, they typically have some sort of regular investment cycle, uh, which is kind of a hard fought thing. Um, and they generally will look like a kind of bunch of, you know, standard compute nodes, um, maybe that are accelerated in some degree or f uh, uh, in, in some way, but they are really designed for a broad spectrum of needs. Um, they tend to be victims of their own success in terms that kind of very busy with long wait times. And um, there's sometimes there's a kind of model which exists locally around how you might add to these things by sort of grant income and, and that, that kind of thing. I think, you know, one of the things about smoothing barriers of, of entry, you know, you, there's not many sites that, that implement something where there's a kind of competitive process to get on these machines. Because really what you're trying to facilitate here is getting people into the position to actually go and bid for funding elsewhere and bring additional grant capture into the organization. But one of the uh, nice things about some of the tier three facilities is actually people have managed to, some sites have managed to build on top of those and augment them because the tier three exists, they then augment them with additional capabilities such as Cambridge's tier two system, which basically is one of this, is a hybrid between um, the University of Cambridge resource, a tier two resource for EPSRC, um, Dirac, um, you know, and as a, as a kind of, you know, much bigger than the sum of its parts, its individual parts um, infrastructure. Uh, the Triple M hub around uh, UCL is also like that, and also is the, the uh, Northern Ireland HBC that's built on top of a university provision. So this is kind of what um, Cambridge's machine looks like. It's pretty big and wide and varied, and it's been in multiple generations where the oldest bit is in, was established in 2018, and the newest bit was in, in, in just recently in 2021 with, the, with a Dirac investment. So there was a kind of initial investment, um, which, which is more along, uh, I forget who actually did put the put, funded that one, but this, the first one, of the, the middle one, the 672 Cascade Lakes was a, um, EPSRC investment and then the one on top was a Dirac investment and what they kind of do is they've got a big pool basically and they basically add, dish out time to these um, 
these various people. So people aren't tied to the actual machine that they have funded, they get a share of everything um, with, with, with what's in there. And the way to get access to this, really easiest way, is actually through um, the access to HPC call through the EPSLC tier two, um, unless you're a member of Dirac or one of the other things, but there's an open access call through um, EPSRC that's available. Uh, in terms of GPUs, this is probably the largest GPU f um, sort of provision within the, within the UK um, for academics, um, where uh, called, called J2. So it's a large consortium originally formed around um, deep learning and machine learning, but actually this kind of infra accelerated infrastructure is really good from like a dynamics as well. So now the consortium includes both the machine learners and the biomech and simulation people. Um, and they've got a, uh, a, basically if you were part of that consortium, then it's relatively straightforward to get an allocation of resources on, 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 these, on this machine. What else have we got? Okay, this I'm less certain about because Owen gave me this slide a long time ago. <laughs> Um, but this is the Triple M hub, so maybe Matt, if you've got any extra things to this, but I think that that's the old system. The new one's called Young, and it came into being about a year and a half ago. As part of the thing that got defunded as well. Yes, um, that's the original machine that was just Thomas, and then it became this Thomas replacement, which is Young at the right, top right. That's what's been in action for the last year and a half. Thomas has been turned off. Thomas has been turned off, and Michael is the is a different thing for battery. Yeah. In last week, yeah. Um, the, I think the, the, the important thing to think about this is that it's actually two consortia, two science consortia that have put in for this. And these kinds of consortia are massive users of Archer. And basically, so a lot of kind of the runoff capacity from uh, the materials modeling uh, uh, sort of, well, it's materials modeling hub. What are the two consortia, Matt? What are they called? UKCP and MCC, which is Materials Chemistry Consortium. So they have an internal um, sort of peer review process that basically allocates resources for those particular science applications. Um, and basically, this machine runs CASTAP and VASP very well. Um, up in Edinburgh, next to the National Supercomputer at, um, at EPCC, there's a, a facility called Cirrus, um, which originally um, was very much a, a normal kind of st standard Beowulf kind of cluster with, um, with 280 compute nodes, um, which and a little bit of GPU, which basically then in 2020 got a, a kind of upgrade where a lot of it became accelerated um, so and what they're trying to do is really look at you know preparing people for because uh, they believe that at the kind of exascale coping with machines that aren't the same in terms of amount of GPUs accelerated non-accelerated is going to be something that we actually have to have to deal with so um, this is very much a, a machine about preparing for kind of that heterogeneity at the kind of excess scale. Um, we get start to touch on stuff that's a little bit more niche now. So um, the people in Br from Bristol in the room and Bath and places will talk about this machine, which is uh, Isambard, um, which is actually all based on, well, the majority of it is based on a couple of generations of ARM-based processors, which is probably the most common processor around nowadays, thanks to our phones. Um, so that recently got a um, this ARM 64FX um, upgrade. Um, but one of the interesting things that's sort of on the side of this is this multi-architecture comparison system. So they have a kind of auto build kind of function going on where you throw software at it and it does these nightly compiles against all these various, and sort of regression testing against all these various systems, including normal kind of x86 computing, um, the, the sort of couple of generations of accelerator, uh, some AMD nodes, Knight's Landing, believe it or not, and also some Power9 V100 um, things. The nice thing about this sort of system is it shares a common software stack 
from Cray with the National HPC facility. Um, and Cray tools are, are really nice, even though they might not perform, it'll, they'll often tell you things that other software tools don't tell you. Uh, this is down in the Met Office um, in Exeter um, with the... Um, okay, I don't need that one. Um, as part of the last, the, uh, the sort of new kids on the block were this Northern Ireland HPC, and this was very much a more of a, an outreach-based facility around taking the HPC facility at Belfast and actually opening out something um, for uh, for Northern Ireland, um, because th there's very little national capability and community there. So um, this is a kind of Rome-based system, um, and they've normally got a a 65% share for sort of Northern Ireland consortium researchers, and they let the rest of the UK bid for 35% of those resources through a resource allocation mechanism through the access to HPC call. Um, so these went in reasonably like about a year ago through the COVID pandemic. Um, there was a couple of machines that, that went in the HPC Midlands got, a, got an up upgrade um, to a kind of, this was a, a machine that focuses on ensemble calculations. So it's a, it's a sort of standard uh, Beowulf kind of thing with some accelerated, machi uh, accelerated machines in there, but their focus is was, was on ensemble calculations. Um, and the main way to get access to that is via the access to HPC call, which so and their website has really good advice on how to write a technical um, assessment, which is uh, which is worth reading. Um, there's also a second um, sort of large scale accelerated machine with the latest technology from Nvidia in it, in form of this machine called Baskerville, uh, which is based out of Birmingham. Um, this the the main way. This is another one which is um, consortium has access to it, but also there is a an access to HPC call way that to to get access to this machine as well. This is the one which I obviously know a bit more about. Um, this is the what we what we might call the Northern Intensive Computing Environment a machine called Bead. Um, it was a Durham led thing on behalf of the N8 Research Partnership. And really what we thought about when we were bidding for this facility was, well, what's the main limitation of accelerated computing? And actually the main limitation is everything's got to fit on the accelerator. So can we give the opportunity to people to go beyond the scale of a single card or, or whatever? How might we be able to help people use memory coherence and, and things like that? There is obviously a... Uh, because the running costs are being borne by the NA institutions, there's a sort of consortium access um, for for part of it, uh, but then 38% of it is made available um, via national access. Most of that actually is 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 for, is is channeled through two HPC, con uh, actually three HPC consortia, um, but then there's also the access to HPC mechanism for anything that isn't really caught caught up. Um, one of the key things here is that you've kind of got to have an accelerated code and want to push the boundaries in order to get onto this machine. So it is, there is quite a, um, quite a learning curve. One thing that we wanted to make sure we had is basically a, a person supporting um, this at each, at each N8 site um, that, um, that they kind of committed to. So um, we, it was, you know, this machine would not get used if it wasn't for the people. And we, we went in and said, you know, you'll be able to judge by this success. If we have no usage, then it means that we actually haven't helped anybody, you know. Um, okay, now, uh, in terms of the national capability, we are now, Archer 2 has been completely put in now. It, this, is, this thing is now totally there, which is brilliant. Um, so we've got 28 petaflops of computing in Edinburgh. Um, which is all managed by EPSRC in terms of the um, allocations. The, uh, the, I think what's interesting here is really the metrics that went into the procurement of this facility, which was all about scientific throughput. You know, we want to do 10 times what we can do on Archer. 
right? And then, and that is how all the requirements really, you know, all played out and went through. So there was a huge um, emphasis on benchmarking, and uh, in terms of in terms of going into what would actually purchase. But you know, I think maybe I maybe I stressed it, maybe I haven't stressed it, but a lot of these systems are all designed around a specific purpose. So you may look at, you know, I remember talking to Susan Morell at EPSRC once, and you know, she was often trying to justify why every single university invested in their own HPC, or why, they, why does it all look the same, right? But actually, these things have been designed for specific communities to solve specific problems. Okay, so most systems, um, all of these, I think you can go to, you can contact the service directors of, or there's an explicit mechanism on the website that basically says, um, can I get some pump priming access? I think I have a, a, a useful case on this. Can I have a go, right? And most systems will allow you to get onto those. And particularly if, if you are a DRI professional and you're able to offer a scientific area support, then, service directors like me will be really, really, really happy that you, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna, there's some person gonna support researchers to get on that system. Um, there's also um, kind of competency test based ways of getting access to things like Archer or Archer 2 in, in terms of a, uh, a driving test. So you prove that you know how to submit a job or whatever, and you get a minimal application allocation on the, on the machines. And then for larger things, there's the open access call, the access to HPC call that happens twice per year. Um, the um, thing that's needed on here though is, there's, it's sort of a two stage process. The first stage is a technical assessment is made. So you kind of match, you write a case that says, this this, I've got this problem and I, and I think that this machine is the one that n these resources are required to actually solve that problem. That gets initially looked at by that service. It goes, yeah, I agree, or I don't agree. I think it should go over there instead. Um, and then once it's got its kind of resource, it's, it's sort of matched to a resource, it then has a science a sort of case put around it. And then those are then uh, ranked by panel, et cetera, for the various allocations. Um, if you happen to be, if people happen to be part of a uh, high-end computing consortia, like we do for HEC Biosim um, on BEAD, or there's ov obviously the, the Triple M hub and things like that, they have their own internal mechanisms to actually um, to allocate those things. Um, so, and Matt, your UKCP, kind of chair of that allocation group, yeah, okay. So, um, what kind of comes next in, in all this? And y you know, you may see these things, these uh, the future systems in terms of, you know, the kind of a large a case for large scale computing that came out um, towards the end of last year. It talked about you know these you know a range, which is good, not one size fits all, of well coordinated supercomputing uh, services with appropriate diversity to support the research program of UKRI and UK industry notes. It's not talking about, oh, we need, you know, kind of a certain set of well-defined services, you know, in, in the, 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 this capacity of x86 or whatever. It talks about diversity. And I think that this, what seems to be really coming across around the kind of whole DRI professional thing within the, you know, is, is about, you know, where is the innovation? Where is that kind of, that, that conversation between, you know, the knowledge about the machines and the research area that then basically allows people to do things that they couldn't do before, which is really kind of interesting. Um, so, and it talks, th these things talk about sustainable long-term funding for, you know, particularly around staff and also the batteries not included kind of approach, because a lot of the system, these things come as capital only uh, and people have to scrabble around trying to find the power or the budget for the power, which is not insignificant. Um, and, you know, there, there's, it's, it's, you know, yes, you can invest in hardware, but there's massive acceptance within the UK that the software environments that we work within are absolutely critical um, for any kind of future competitive, uh, competitiveness. There's visions of deploying exaflop systems and pre-exascale systems at the moment. Um, and, you know, there's this also, this kind of how do we actually, 
as a community, not just buy the same old computer that we would be buying for years with the same technology? How do we actually use the vendor community to kind of help kind of as evaluate emerging technology and how can we feed that in in order that it, we can actually get a kind of step up in our in our research? Um, is this you? Brilliant. I'm going to hand over to Marion now. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm just um, talking a bit about uh, the funding that there is for research software development and um, also then um, after that a bit about um, the different communities. And I'm very aware that you might not be all in HPC and not all in um, RSE or so, so we're clearly missing um, certain topics here. And I would like to encourage you all to um, basically um, take this opportunity then also to to tell us what you are in and so but um, let's first start um, with the funding for um, RSE or research software development so um, again this might not be complete so um, a couple of years ago um, when the RSE uh, movement started and so um, there was some lobbying um, with EPSSE and EPSSE were actually then um, the first ones to um, provide um, a specific fellowship for these type of DRI professions. So the RSE fellowships um, were awarded, um, was it three or four times? Phil, you will probably know. Three. Three, three times. Um, unfortunately, um, the last uh, round was the last round um, on this uh, fellowship, but I think this fellowship has been crucial in making universities aware of um, the importance of RSE work and um, the RSE fellows themselves have done a lot also um, in community building and in working with UKRI and so to, to raise the profile um, of this um, type of work. Um, instead of the RSE fellowship, um, people interested in this kind of fellowship are now um, encouraged to apply for an Open Plus fellowship the Open Plus Fellowship, again, um, ask for um, a specific project you're working on, but the plus bit also um, encourages you to have a community focus or have a community part of um, the, the work that you intend to do in that time. Uh, the downside is that you are competing to all, with all the other researchers in the UK as well for these fellowships, and I think um, it's important to, to consider also to join one of um, the review panels or the review colleges because um, I think in order to have a bigger chance to actually get one of these fellowships, you um, should have more RSEs and RIEs and so on to um, join um, the, the um, review panels for this. Um, just recently, um, we had two major calls for um, RSE work, so there was the Software for Research Communities call that was just awarded, and there was the Development of Research Software Engineering call um, that has been awarded to a consortium between, um, is it Edinburgh, Oxford, Southampton, and Imperial, I think. Um, with a, a project they call Universe HPC and which hopes to um, give like master level modules on RSE topics as well as working with the community and um, providing basically um, development for people who are interested in going into um, RSE work. Um, there's um, other funding available and I've just put some things down there that came to my mind at that point. So there's the Dirac RSE support um, uh, that people can apply for, um, so which is provided by a group of Dirac RSEs. Um, the Met Office, which was um, mentioned before as well, is um, providing funding together with UKRI um, on, on um, research software engineering, SDFC as um, Alan has mentioned previously is um, also providing funding and for example there was the the um, swimmer grant for example that I as an RSE am, um, am on one of these um, projects that were awarded so um, they provide um, uh, software engineering um, funding as well so I would just because this is such an um, 
incomplete list. And I I know that a few years ago, or so I think there were some um, surveys around uh, around um, digital humanities uh, funding and DRI input to digital humanities work, but I've not seen a specific call for this. So I just would like to ask the audience whether you know any further funding or when, whether any of you knows about uh, digital humanities research software engineering or funding. And so I think there's someone in the back. I think Mark Hedges is doing some of that work down in London with, um, what's his name? Nice guy. I'll talk to you in a bit. Can't remember, can't remember the other guy's name. No, Tobias Blanca. Okay, thank you. So they are working on um, setting up this funding or um, are being funded? Thank you. Does anyone else know any other funding that there is? Yeah, Phil. Can you, uh, uh, there's the uh, embedded computational science and engineering, the ECSE funding, which is available from Archer 2, administered by EPTC, which is fairly light touch and can fund up to 12 months of a project, I think. Is the present one? Yeah. Okay, thank you. There's one other. There's a Chan Zuckerberg Foundation call open at the moment for open um, research science software. Okay, great, thank you. Any more? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so um, I will just uh, talk a little bit about ex about Excalibur. So um, who of you is involved in any type of activity with Excalibur? Okay, so that's about a third or so of us. Um, so um, for the others, <laughs> so this is an initiative um, that was led by um, UKRI together with the Met Office, the Atomic Energy Agency, um, to um, work on making the UK ready for exit scale and um, providing basically um, the funding for what's needed to get there and to, to develop um, exascale software. And they had um, or have this couple of themes there. The RSE knowledge integration was one of them. Then they have the high priority re re use cases, emerging requirements for high performance algorithms, cross-cutting research and hardware enabling software. So um, um, these uh, calls, um, uh, so a, a good part of these calls have been out. There is another call that's currently out or coming up, which I have the name forgotten, forgotten about um, at the moment. Um, one, um, one, one central topic about the RSE knowledge integration um, was uh, actually um, basically so uh, sharing the knowledge between the projects and sharing the knowledge with the community. And that is why from the uh, cross-cutting uh, projects on, they um, started to require each project to have a knowledge exchange coordinator. So the knowledge exchange coordinators had to set up a, a plan basically or, or explain how they um, help to communicate their um, outcome and their research and also work together. So um, we have monthly meetings um, where we meet with the other knowledge exchange coordinators and are talking about um, our projects and our activities, um, but also um, about things that we um, can do together. And we're currently um, organizing a workshop, which will, will be co-located with the RSE conference, which will take place beginning of, New, uh, of uh, September in Newcastle. And that will be um, in collaboration or together with the HPC champions, um, which is the former Archer, two, uh, Archer um, champions community, where we have a one day workshop um, to talk about RSE wor work um, and HPC work and um, have lightning talks and discussions and software problem discussions. And so to um, to basically um, exchange our knowledge in our community there. Um, talking about communities, 
Um, again, I've just put a list of things that came to my mind here. So we have lots of communities um, around in this field and um, it's really, uh, so we have the communities who are basically there for, okay, I'm part of a tribe, I'm not alone in what I'm doing, I can exchange ideas and then there are the communities of practice which are more work focused, working together on, on a type of practice. And I would just read out these communities and would like to give you to give a show of hands so that you um, basically can look around and see, okay, who is in these communities? Who can I uh, talk to? So we have HPC SICK, for example, who is on those mailing lists. Okay, that's quite a lot. Uh, we have the HPC champions. That's not so many. So come to our Newcastle workshop and then you can meet, meet more and be part of that. So we have the um, UK RSE Slack with thousands of people on there. Okay, thank you, that's a lot. Um, the RSE Leaders Network. Only two that I can see there. Oh, people online just put it in the chat. I can't see what you're putting in the chat, but the other online people can see it there. Um, then um, we have the RSE Society and um, the, the things that, I, that they are setting up and the conference that they are organizing and um, they are supporting, for example, regional RSE groups. Who is part of any regional RSE group? Oh, that's very few. Okay, so like the, um, I think RSE Midlands is just um, starting to, to run and then we have the London uh, research software, Lon uh, London and, and uh, surroundings or so, and we have, um, yeah, NHCIR, but also the north of England RSEs starting. Um, there are local RSE groups which are actually not um, RSE groups uh, that work together as a central service, but um, community groups. Are any of those of you in one of those? I know Northumbria, is, for example, setting one up at the moment. So that's not so popular. Okay, so we have um, the events and initiatives fund in the um, RSE Society um, where you can actually apply um, for funding if you want to run a certain type of workshop or so, or any kind of event. Um, and we have also the special interest groups and working groups um, that can be set up with this kind of um, funding money uh, or grant and initiatives uh, fund money if you would like to work on a, spe a certain topic there. So what else do I have on my list? The Software Sustainability Institute. So who is an SSI fellow? I see three at the moment. Who has been to a collaboration workshop? Many more. Next one running next week. Um, has anyone taken part in a repro hack or organized one? One, two, three, I can see. Okay, so um, these are um, some in, in the UK. We also have international ones. I, I won't go through the whole list um, bit by bit. I will just mention we have the International Council of RSE Associations where um, re representatives of the established RSE associations are working together. We have the Research Software Alliance that works not just um, on research software engineering, but research software in general. We have um, yeah, SIG HPC, the software carpentries and library carpentries, data carpentries. We have women in H H high performance computing, HPC huddle, friends of HPC, I've seen that coming up um, end of last week on Twitter. So um, there are lots of communities and I would like to encourage you to think about, okay, if I am not in any of these, maybe this is the chance to um, talk to people that you've seen are in one of these and to just feel a bit more connected basically to other people who are working on that in that field. Um, I think um, we've talked a lot about HPC, a lot about RSE, but um, there are other funding opportunities and other communities um, uh, out there, or maybe we are missing some of those. So, uh, for example, the data steward, people working in libraries, people in research data management. Or so, so um, if you know 
of any of these communities, feel welcome to send us a slide so that we can include it <laughs> in our next presentation and so. And um, I don't know, is anyone here who would like to invite people around to their community at this point? Can you? I work in the uh, uh, academic library and archive. I would very much like to involve uh, uh, academic librarian and archivist, uh, especially uh, from the humanity aspect as well, because uh, the department I'm working with uh, is uh, like a humanity subject. And uh, I think we are very much on the edge of it, or out of the scope of this kind of work. I'm hoping the kind of new emerging technology and uh, skills can be used in humanity subject as well. Thank you. That sounds interesting. Are there any other people working in this field in the audience or in general working in the library or in the uh, in humanities? Because in that case, I would, so we have more people coming the next days, but in, um, if there are people interested in this, we have the unconference session on um, Wednesday, I think. So feel free, um, once we have, uh, we know where we put our post-its to, um, to, to um, suggest um, a topic or, or something to discuss there. So another, um, thing that um, I'm um, interested in from the innate perspective are the research infrastructure engineering people because we are currently recruiting an RIE position. So um, I think um, it's on the pin board there on the back. And I want to invite you all also, if you have anything that you would like to share with the people here and that be it a position that's open at your institute or something else that you want to share, you can use that pin board um, and put it on there. And if you are in the field of RIE and are interested in building up a um, community um, of some sort, so Simon Hood um, has already done quite a bit of work in, in the NHCIR on that, but if you want to continue this work and are at an N8 university, please have a look at that. Um, that pin board and that job ad. So um, this might be um, something where we actually want to, to do a bit more. So, um, and another thing that I think, or that I personally am very interested in, um, how can we link up all these groups? So we've seen that a lot of us are in many different groups, but I don't think that all these groups are really connected. And I sometimes wonder why why there are so many groups and what is the difference? What is the difference between the Research Software Alliance and the RSE groups and um, all of what's out there and um, how can we talk more to each other? So um, I don't know what the time is. How much longer do we have? Nine minutes. Okay, so. Um, I would like to ask you um, at this, what are we missing slide? Um, what are we missing? Are we missing communities? Are we missing connections? Um, are we just missing slides here because there's so much out there? Um, not really missing, but I want to add a bit of a relevant detail to the Excalibur slide. The a call that's out for at the moment is for the next round of high priority use case projects um but the um intent to submit deadline is the 31st so if anybody's interested in that you've got three days to submit your intent to submit so yeah um excalibur.ac.uk and there's a news item there with a link to the relevant ukri page thank you Um, I think maybe the UK Reproducibility Network. Yeah. Do you want to say a bit more about what that is exactly about? Yeah, well, it's, I think it's an, a network uh, started originally maybe in Bristol. Um, but the idea is that there's a crisis of reproducibility in many disciplines. And it's trying to address this. And there's different types of reproducibility, repeatability, um, uh, and there, it, yeah, there's, so there's lots of different ways in which we can think about that. And I think the people in this room are more interested in computational reproducibility, where 
we know what the input data may be, we know what the processing is going to take. And uh, so this is a one of the few stripes of reproducibility, but there's a reproducibility network um, that's evolving, I guess, and it's uh, fledgling, maybe two or three years old, I think. Okay, thank you. Any others? Yeah, just following. Oh, Christ, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, just following on from that, um, we've got reprohack.org as well, um, who are always looking for people to participate, uh, organised reprohacks as well, and also for academics to submit papers to be considered as well. Um, so, yeah, reprohack.org, do have a look at that one as well, please. Thank you. Um, I'm aware of some of the research data management communities. So, there's um, a GISC research data management discussion list. Um, that's quite interesting if that's your sort of thing and also an international research data alliance that's got various working groups as well that's um, covers people using the data also the systems to store the data great thank you um, can I just ask who of you is working in um, research infrastructure engineering or development do we have anyone here Okay, thank you. Who's working in data? <laughs> Is that the same thing? <laughs> it's the same <laughs> people. <laughs> and the European Open Science Cloud, there's a group there that, well, I guess it's European infrastructure there. Thank you. Anything else or anything that we're missing? So there's a STFC one called IRIS, which is sort of a digital research infrastructure community. Ah, oh, okay, cool. Uh, well, I actually, I think that this means something that I doesn't exist, uh, which is uh, topical communities. So communities about a specific uh, research area, a specific uh, research tool uh, that probably exist locally that help each other locally but that they could share resources across different institutions so it's not about rcs in general but specific about a little bit like the the humanities but more specific about concrete areas fluid dynamics or specific about something i would say that that probably is related with the research conferences on those areas but mm -hmm. maybe more focused on the software that sustain those communities okay thank thank you yeah, Nick. Ah, okay. I, I thought you were <laughs> wanting to say something. Okay. <laughs> the uh, interdisciplinary data centres. So there's uh, ones for different parts of UKRI, including the Environmental Data Service for NERC. But these communities are part of this picture. Thank you. I've heard from NERC it's very hard to get a funding for software, though. Yeah, Phil. Uh, so the Royal Academy of Engineering have some fellowships for software engineering. If, well, all their fellowships, actually, if you phrase it right. Um, and in terms of communities, there's the um, the HECs, the High End Compute Consortia, and the Collaborative Computational Projects, the CTPs, that uh, Alan kind of touched on, but we haven't talked about in terms of supporting software and uh, people that way. And we talked about Excalibur, but there's the US Exascale Project and various EU initiatives in that direction as well. Thank you. Okay, so we are coming to the end. So I would just encourage you again um, for the unconference bit, if there's something that you want to um, discuss in more detail or so, um, put it up as a suggestion and so, and um, yeah, see whether there are other people who are interested in discussing it. And yeah, apart from that, I think we are done with the slides. There are some people, um, have they provided slides? Why are they acknowledged? Yeah, th there was a lot. There was a yeah. Some of this was uh, crowds. Yeah. Yeah. Some of, some of this was crowdsourced <laughs> over the years. <laughs> so send us slides. Yeah. So do send us some any slides on on the things the communities that you see, and we'll add them to the deck uh, for for uh, future reference.
Okay, so thanks very much, everybody. Um, thanks for enjoying this last session. This is the last session of Death by PowerPoint, I assure you. The rest of it is going to be like the, you know, like those panels that tinkered on the edge of the rabbit hole <laughs> for the entire session. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for the first day.